Welcome to Not Your Mother's Radio's meeting with Harvey Kubernick. Harvey is a author, journalist and music historian. From the mid-70s, he has written for music publications such as Melody Maker, Los Angeles Free Press, Crawdaddy, and Phonograph Record. His articles, interviews and reviews have since been published in many other music magazines, including Goldmine, Mojo, Musician, Classic Rock, Discoveries, Uncut, The Los Angeles Times and more. During the 1970s and early 1980s, he also worked as an A&R director for MCA Records and as a record producer. As of 2017, Kubernick was a contributing editor at Record Collector News magazine and had written 10 books on popular music. His books include Hollywood Shack Job, Rock Music in Film and On Your Screen, Canyon of Dreams, It Was 50 Years Ago Today, The Beatles Invade America and Hollywood, and 1967, A Complete Rock Music History of the Summer of Love. So, let's join Harvey and Elliot as they trade stories and have an incredible talk. Enjoy and stay safe. Okay, I'd like to introduce my esteemed guest today, uh, Mr. Harvey Kubernick. And Harvey is um, one of the foremost authors in the uh, music field. He's written dozens of books. The one I have in front of me now is Docs That Rock. And um, anybody who thinks they know music and artists have to get a copy of this book. And um, uh, Harvey, say hello to everybody, and then we'll just get to talking. Hey, Elliot, how are you? I'm very happy good. to do. Uh, very yeah. happy to connect with you. I am so happy to have you online with me finally. And um, Harvey, this book that you wrote, um, first of all, I. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to learn from you today because most of the people that I interview are, are, are musicians and um, are musicians have a different way of thinking than um, us normal people do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you kind of guide me through this and tell me about you and um, what, made, what makes you tick, what made you get into this whole writing field, which is a different animal than anything um, related to music. I will say, you know, I, I've i been told more recently by some very high-profile musicians that they really enjoy my work because they feel I write like a musician. Okay. And I also sort of write cinematically. I mean, you can... I know that I, I have big blocks of visual images that kind of move the narrative forward. So you have a guy here, meaning me, who is a writer and an author... And, um, you know, I'm just fueled and driven by the music. And I think because I've logged a lot of time in recording studios and worked at record labels and have worn a lot of hats, some of that spills into the, uh, to the expedition, which makes me, if not my own genre, rather unique in this, uh, this literary game right. um, it start, you know it started in the early 70s and here I am now yeah now you um the book that I have now docs that rock first of all let me tell you I just started um, your Leonard Cohen book and Neil Young Leonard Cohen everybody uh, knows and Neil Young's heart of gold I'm really looking forward to um, getting those and um, I, I've been reading your book and it, you do write like a musician you kind of put it together from uh, ground zero on every artist and build upon that until you feel that you've known this artist for you know your whole life. And um, your book, I'm assuming, is used in a lot of schools that do have music history classes. Not only that, but um, you know, an order just came in today through my publisher for um, a professor. Uh, David Leaf at the Herb Alpert UCLA School of Music who right. teaches a music mm -hmm. documentary class. Right. Now, with COVID and Zoom and all that, um, it's sort of delayed, um, you know, music schools and especially film schools uh, from ordering or restocking or having this sort of title on their required reading list. That that will all happen next year. Right. But you are right, Um I've been interviewed for people doing masters and PhD papers. Um, 
I've lectured at UCLA and the uh, USC School of Cinema uh, earlier this decade. And um, I'm just kind of watching this title and some of my other books sort of, um, you know, migrate into, we'll call it the rockademic world. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I'm quite happy because I know, and you'll see it in the Leonard Cohen book and the Neil Young book that you're getting, and you feel it devouring um, <clears throat> this title, Rocks That Do- Docks That Rock Music That Matters. Right. Um, there's nothing like it out there. No. And and for people who think they know about Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix you and don't. Motown and Stax, listen, I know you know and feel the music, and we're all in this game together. As band leader Horace Tapscott used to say, we are in collaboration, not in competition. That being stressed... I just don't think anybody else could do this kind of book because I drop in a lot of um, bioregional references about growing up in Hollywood that sort of act as like glue. Right. And since most of the books you get and most of the authors are usually um, from the East Coast or from London or England, you know, because the the publishing world is largely based in New York, it's very rare that you get a native Angelino and a child of Hollywood telling you about music movies and documentaries and just as important TV music programs, whether it be um, American Bandstand or Upbeat, you know, some of the, the things that we grew up on. And people say to me, and then they apologize very quickly. Why did you put TV shows in a book on music documentaries? Uh, there's been a few of those kind of comments. Sure. And I don't think people really do the math. And nobody realized this 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that some of those TV shows that we used to watch, Upbeat, Shindig, Hullabaloo, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. American Bandstand, Shebang, I danced on a couple of these shows briefly. Mm-hmm. A lot of those appearances albeit lip sync or playing live, they populate the music documentaries this century. That's right. They and were, and they, so you see how you see how it all blends together. Pre M T V video. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Also, uh, I'll just I know we've discussed this um um offline, but um uh, the Mod Squad. I don't know if people know this, but the you know you remember the music of the Mod Squad was very um, um, synthetic. Hold on a second. Sure. You're talking to somebody who interviewed Peggy Lipton twice okay. for two of my previous well, books. Well, do do I have to say anything else? Okay. Well, listen to this. Do you know who was doing the synthesizer work on that TV show? I think was it Don Preston? Ian Underwood. Ian Underwood, right? Yes. Uncredited, by the way. Uncredited. Kudos. Yeah, you were close. No, no, no. By the way, Paycheck, he may or may not have been in SAG after or the Musicians Union. We don't know at the time, do we? No, but, uh, I, you know, speaking to um, speaking to Ian, uh, he told me that that was his first gig when he left the Mothers. Uh, Quincy Jones had something to do with him getting that gig. Right. Yeah, Quin- Quincy uh-huh. always encouraged... Um, can you hear me okay? okay? Yeah, yeah. Quincy always encouraged young musicians, but just as important, he was pretty early in the tip of um, synthesizers and and new and yes. new musical right. instruments. Yep. And he also um, he was never. How do I say it? Because I met him very early. Um, uh-huh. He he. There's me, people in the background talking, but you can hear me fine, right? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he was not weirded out by rock and roll people in 66, 67, 68. He knew about the BJ, the Beatles when he was VJ records. He, um, you know, was friends with Jack Nietzsche, the arranger composer. So he, he would be hip enough to understand where Ian Underwood was coming from right. following his Mothers of Invention stint. Yep. But um, I was a big fan of the Mod Squad. I interviewed Peggy twice for uh-huh. a couple, one of the stars of the movie. So, and, and, uh, and Quincy's wife. For Yeah, for, yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. So she left us, um, I think, like a year ago, but um, she's in two or three of my books, and 
she was around um, the Sunset Strip. She's actually on the cover. We'll call her a model. Right. At when the the, the Turtles did an album called You Baby. Right. It's, they had a hit record. She's on the front cover of that album with a bunch of people, a shot by the legendary photographer Guy Webster. Really? I realize so, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, like I said, I, I know these people from growing up in Hollywood. Wow. I then encounter them when they're married to somebody or not married to somebody or in some Splitsville thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so when it's time to be Harvey Kubernick, author, interviewer, music historian, chronicler, they're always delighted to roll out their rock and roll history before they became TV or film stars. Yeah, so TV and um, and Hollywood uh, always went hand in hand. No doubt about it. I mean, literally three blocks from my high school in West Hollywood, Fairfax High, uh, on the corner of Beverly and Fairfax was CBS TV, with, with the proud sign that hailed Television City in Hollywood, where I would go to a bunch of TV show tapings, whether it be in the mid '70s, Dinah Shore when Iggy Pop or David Bowie were on the show. show I, or re- going I, re- to I, I remember that show as it was yesterday. I went to that show. I went to the taping of a share show that Bowie did. Wow. But even earlier, I went to tapings of the Danny Kay show, and I. And in 1963, as a kid, it might be 62, but I think it was 63, I I seem to recall going to see a Judy Garland show that was taped there, and Streisand did a duet with her. My mother, Hilda, thankfully still with us, turning 80, 97 in January, wow, from you. 1962 to 1972, maybe, 73. Um, for 10 years, she worked at Columbia Pictures as a secretary and doing stenography. But there was a two- or three-year period where she worked largely with the Monkees at Ray Burt Productions when the Monkees show was being developed and broadcast, and that kind of spilled into Easy Rider. Yeah. And she also typed some of the scripts for the TV show Banyan, Wow. So we it, Hollywood was a smaller world then. You could go to preview houses. You could go to TV tapings. Um, <clears throat> to, to show you how things have changed, in 1965, I don't even think it was 1966, they had the Academy Awards at the Santa Monica C- Civic Auditorium at, at the beach. Right. And... They needed people constantly to fill up the seats. And I have this fond memory of watching my parents arrive in their beige and pala to go to the Academy Awards. Um, now you can't even get two miles from the place and sure. you realize that the consumers or the people in the seats have very little to do with the industry or are really in the industry. But it was a very loose world then, and I just happened to live in a in a city where all the recording studios were a mile or two away, and the movie studios were a few miles away. They were all bike rides or hitchhiking methods or buses. I didn't get too consumed by it, um, <clears throat> uh, unlike some of my friends, simply because... I not only had to go to school, I had an after-school job for a few hours each day, and that continued even at a junior college where I worked at a library for 18 months. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't carouse and go to the Sunset Strip every night and see every show. But I I went out a couple times a week and saw a lot of people from 1959 to currently. And, um, And economically, you could afford it. Right. Um, and it was kind of a different world, and it had a very big impact on me, and I think that really is displayed in the books I do. Yeah, well, you definitely write like a Hollywood native. Like, you know, you've, you, know you were there from the beginning. And, um, I mean, well, I'm born, I'm born in a hospital that's literally on the edge of Echo Park in East Hollywood, overlooking the Hollywood 101 freeway. Well, okay? Yeah. I mean, and I really 
did go to schools briefly like Los Angeles City College and graduated West LA Junior College, now West LA College, and pivoted down to San Diego State University and graduated. But I did spend my the, the decade of the 50s till I was like eight and a half or something in downtown Los Angeles in Crenshaw Village. Um, and, um, you know, the, the music you hear at five, six, seven, eight, and nine makes a very big dent on your senses from the first record you buy to the first radio station you discover, um, even if it's a transistor radio. And so I think that carries forward in the work I do, but I know the readers and people like you, I know you feel it because my my game is to be original and penetrate right. and i know those that mission has been accomplished right now um you've brought this up in many in numerous interviews and, and in books uh that la and san francisco are pretty much um two different uh, worlds you know which surprises me <clears throat> simply because you're talking to a guy that collects the Jefferson Airplane right. and has recorded Paul Kantner and has autographs of Grace Slick and Marty Ballin. Right. And, um, you know, I never understood this self-imposed rivalry or in this kind of coalesces at the Monterey International Pop Festival in June 1967 where a lot of the San Francisco acts very few of them natives, they are relocated from other places, viewed L.A. as some kind of plastic, phony town, and that San Francisco was the real item. And then I have had to inform other music historians and teachers and DJs, and not out of revenge or anger, it's a comedy riff. Every one of those groups constantly signed big record deals in L.A. and Hollywood-based record companies and recorded most of their albums in Hollywood in the same studio where those plastic people recorded. So I never could understand because Paul Kantner said, I like L.A. and San Francisco. And I said, welcome to the club. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I could see it having two different flavors of music. Yes, um, that definitely is, uh, you know, is acceptable. Well, part of it, part of it was it really wasn't until maybe the early or mid seventies that San Francisco, in the technical sense, did not have the recording studio available, right. you know, for artists up there uh, that they could start recording in San Francisco yeah. in the very late sixties and in the mid seventies and have the record plan up there in Sausalito right. and and other you know, studios up there. Well, CBS. And, Los a- and Los Angeles had had all these studios and new equipment and it w- was a proven, had proven landmark sound temples right. available. And so therefore, like the first four or five Jefferson Airplane albums were recorded at RCA Studios on Sunset Strip. Right. Uh, one, one or two of the Grateful Dead albums had been done down here. Um, I mean, the list is endless. Even Credence Clearwater did the vocals or the backing tracks for the Green River album, or you know something around 1970, uh-huh. um, because this place had the locations, the engineers, and the record company apparatus available. Right. Um, and now, of course, that has changed with home studio recordings and sure. all kinds of stuff. But um, the media, whether it be Rolling Stone magazine or the Berkeley Barb. Uh, or some of the, this probably extends to the Village Voice and some of the East Coast magazines of the time. I'm talking I and Cheetah magazine and things. And I'm talking 67, 68, 69, 70. They fostered this San Francisco against LA mentality. Mm-hmm. Or it'd be done comedically. But there'd be a riff or something, and you know Lou Reed and people like that would constantly take some barbs at L.A. music. Right. Yet the Velvet Underground did recording out here, including a version of Heroin was done mm-hmm. out in in West Hollywood. So um, 
studios and the environment play a very big part in the music we hear and, and, and love. Oh, yeah, yeah. Also, um, let's see, San Francisco got, I think, its first big um, uh, studio push when CBS moved in. Right, and they started relocating, you know, engineers and producers like yeah. Fred Catero yeah, I spoke or to Dave, Fred. Who, who, right, who I interviewed for my Leonard Cohen book. Yeah, Fred, and and he went up. He was one of the first, we'll call it transplants, and then David Rubinson, I think, yep, maybe David. followed him. They, yep. The Columbia people, under the direction of Clive Davis, who right. was kind of helming things there, they knew San Francisco was a destination spot to discover and nurture talent and yeah. record it there as well. And then you had people like Elliot Mazer, an engineer producer. Uh-huh. Um, he had his master's wheel recording studio, plus countless live albums right. that Elliot and and Fred Catero worked on it, like Winterland yep. and you know the Fillmore Still West. Yep. You know, uh, so that that was that played a part of San Francisco having its own identity or at least being. A portal uh, for product to be discovered, nurtured, created, and shipped to retail. Yeah. Now, um, are you? Do you know um, Bill Parazzo? No. Is he a musician or engineer? No, no, no. I'll go through him in a second. And um, uh, um, um, Jeffrey Traeger. Jeff Traeger. No. Okay. They were in the record business in San Francisco, and um, Bill sold records. For, um, weren't they weren't they rack jobbers and stuff yeah, like pretty that? Much, weren't pretty they? much, yeah. Yes, Bill yeah. Was. They they work they were they because because of the um, the rela- fantasy records and um, uh-huh. some of the distributors up there. Um, yeah, you know they they were involved in in early uh, distribution of product to like Tower Records and yes. stuff like they that. Help, yeah, they That's, help. They help start Tower Records actually. Right. Uh, yep. With the so that they help start Tow- Tower and Russ Solomon in Sacramento yep. Yep. and yep. help build the um the the second flagship store we'll call it on uh, Columbus and Bay Street. Yes. And yes. distributors were very important back then because they, um, they th- there was no online ordering there was none of that and the world had just gone to fm radio away from a strict am radio format for rock music exposure yeah. and distributors um who would take singles and albums um were very important to get your stuff stocked in chain outlets including the uh, mom and pop shops as well Right, you know what Bill was telling me? Jukeboxes was the unsung hero for uh, the record companies. Jukeboxes go back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, and were still a vibrant element all through the 60s, even spilling into the early 70s because um, singles, 45 RPM RPM configurations. Right. Um, were stocked in those jukeboxes, and that airplay was very important for a couple of reasons. Obviously, airplay in a club or a restaurant is one thing, but ASCAP and BMI people would log the the dimes and the quarters. You know, the airplays were logged as airplay and exposure. Right. So where there was a little tiny bit of revenue stream happening, but it was a principal element uh, especially in bars and restaurants and teen centers, where getting those songs on that jukebox was very important. And if you read things like Cashbox magazine, they even had sections in the back of the magazine that were about Seaberg jukeboxes and and you know airplay stuff and new jukebox things. And then all of a sudden, the Walkman and the boomboxes showed up, and that sure. kind of world kind of dried up a little bit. Yeah. Very, very important, including um, record producers and record labels would sometimes cut deals with jukebox operators to stock their label product pretty much exclusively in some outlets. People were always trying to find ways of getting, you know, audio exposure. And also, um, um, he gave me an example, Ray Charles, um, on Busted, and um, uh, hit the road, Jack. weren't on any albums, right? And the way that he that he sold them was he put them in a lot of the bars. You know, you're sitting there, you know, drowning your sorrows, and hit the road, Jack comes on, or I'm busted, and you kind of had an infinity with it, and um, you ran out and bought it. 
Okay. And yes, and that's that was a I don't know if the word ploy is the exact term. That was a method that Atlantic Records and later ABC Records labels that Ray Charles had recorded on would get singles tested and exposed initially. And if there was jukebox reaction, if there was jukebox reaction, sometimes they'd flip a record and you'd discover the B-side of the single, or sometimes those songs would end up on some sort of greatest hits album, yeah. or... The dividends of it is when cassette tapes and the first CDs started coming out. That was around the mid-80s. People would take some of those obscure singles and they would be able to be put on CDs which had expanded you know, length, yeah, yep, yep. time. So the ramifications of the jukebox um, continue. I mean, I have a very good jukebox story. Do we have time to talk about it? You have all the time you need. <clears throat> wow. And you, you would know this name, the journalist and author Albert Goldman. Oh, who, yes, um, sure. Okay. Taught at Columbia University, wrote for Life magazine, did a book on Elvis, did a book on John Lennon. He was working on a book on the doors when he died many, many years ago. I think his papers are at some university. And I remember uh, the record producer and songwriter Kim Fowley who actually uh, appears on the debut Mothers of Invention album, Freak Out. He's on Help, I'm a Rock. He called me up one night. He said, Albert Goldman just came by my apartment and interviewed me for three and a half hours on the doors. And I said, well, that's really cool because you knew the band. You uh, introduced them on stage at the Toronto uh, Music Festival in 1969. You socialized with them. Um, I know you did some recording sessions with Gene Vincent and all the doors came to Elektra Records to meet Gene. But what was the, um, m- what was the most interesting thing Albert Goldman told you about Jim Morrison and why would he spend three hours with you? I mean, you could spend three minutes or six hours with Kim, but, um, right. Kim said something very interesting to me. He said, you can't believe the research this guy has done on Jim Morrison. I said, well, I wouldn't expect any less. He's writing for Life magazine, and he has huge books out, and he's you know, a scholar. And he said, well, the reason why he specifically wanted to talk to me is he did the research and found the BMI Broadcast Music Incorporated. He found the track records from the jukebox of a club the Doors used to play next door to the Whiskey A Go Go before they became kind of a house band at the Whiskey A Go Go. And Kim had recorded a record called The Trip, kind of an instrumental, kind of an organ instrumental driven tune where he riffs on top of it. And it kind of always reminded us of the Doors' Soul Kitchen song on the Doors' first album. And so uh, Albert Grossman said, I want to speak to you, Kim Fowley, because your song, The Trip, literally got the most airplays logged on some of the sheets I've seen in 1966 in Hollywood, but specifically um, at this club the door sort of incubated at. And um, Kim said... It was the song that was very popular because it was the song that would be played on the jukebox when the Doors took a break between the two or three sets they would play. Oh, wow. And Albert Grossman wanted to know about the tune and kind of saw a little bit of the influence on Soul Kitchen just because it was an organ, uh, pumped out organ, right. you know, f- centric tune. But that shows you that the power of the jukebox still existed in 1966. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, um, I remember as a kid, every diner had a jukebox on the table. You know, um, it, well, instead of FM radio promo man and the internet and new media, that jukebox was a viable asset in exposure, especially when people were doing sock hops right. and playing at colleges and doing early clubs or actually playing you know, multi-artists like Murray the K kind of shows in New York and out here as well. 
where there'd be eight artists on the bill doing, you know, 15 minutes each. They were people that were byproducts of singles, RPM discs, not really album artists right. yet. And so all of that brought you to the attention. If you didn't hear it on AM radio, um, you might have heard it in a diner or in a jukebox or at a teen center or at an over 18 or 21 um, you know, location. And, and if it made an impact, the record would get played again and again. Sure. And so you'd hear Good Lovin' by the young rascals who became the rascals. And that world was codependent on that, those kind of, um, you know, aspects to get things heard. Right. Wow. So that, it was more or less like the first mobile DJ. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So, wow, um, incredible, great story. And, so, and 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 let me tell you something. Some of that informs you know my current book. When I, I I have this background and I have this history, and the Southern California nurturing that I think you can um, feel it when you go into the chapters of the book, mm-hmm. even though it's kind of a a, a volume that is about the celluloid and, and cinematic right. portions of these groups and individuals and musicians you dig but they all it all kind of merges together and sometimes you know i think people get a better understanding of the groups after they read this book because we've seen some of these documentaries or i remind you of them or i introduce you to several you've never heard of right. which is one of the reasons I go through all the pain and gain to do these kind of books. And you can tell there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in these books. A lot of, <sighs> lot of work went into these books. Let me books. tell you something. I, this, you know, doing this kind of book was a lot harder than doing my bar mitzvah, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, and I, I had a very hard half Torah because... Well, my bar mitzvah was on leap year, some crazy February 29th thing that happens only every four years. Yeah. So I had a double length half Torah wow. that I had to learn phonetically off of vinyl being pressed nice. because it was like the longest one of the year. Yeah. And that's a pretty heavy thing to lay on a kid turning 13. Wait a second. You want to hear a bar mitzvah nightmare? My bar mitzvah. Here we go. My bar mitzvah was on a Thursday, Thanksgiving Day. Whoa! Wait a second. Thanksgiving Day, so you know what that means. You have to read it right out of the Torah because it's a Thursday, not a Saturday. Yes, yes. So I had to learn it out of the Torah. No vowels. No vowels. And the only good thing that happened from that was, um, how many years? Two years later, I got to see the Rolling Stones at Madison Square at, Garden. At Madison Square Garden, right? Two years to the day. And um, I went to the afternoon show on Thursday with Ike and Tina, wow. and Janice Love Joplin that. was on stage with Ike and Tina. And yeah, um, you saw you saw Janice come out. And by yeah. the way, part of that, I don't know if you got to the Alan Arkish chapter in my book, who did yes. Rock and Roll High School. Yes, I did. And and he he talks about he was his prime teacher at NYU was Marty Scorsese. Well, yeah. And Scorsese and Michael Wadley, who did um, the Woodstock movie, uh-huh. showed showed Alan and a few people some of the first edits of Flying the Family Stone and a couple of the sections that Scorsese edited on Woodstock. Okay. And he talks about it in my book in the chapter. Um, and then after they saw some of the previews of Woodstock, and this is before the movie came out, they all went to the Madison Square Garden to see the Rolling Stones I, and I continue Tina Turner and B.B. King play. Well, wow, that was the next So day. all this kind of personal history, not just of me, but the people I interview, they have an incessant need uh-huh. to reveal things to me. And, and I, I don't know how this is going to come across, I kind of have a policy, um, and not because I'm some sort of prude or some kind of censor, I don't want to do books that are that are propelled by sex, drugs, and kink, and the defunctional heroin addict. Right. That's not my gig. So everybody kind of knows when you've been in this racket like I've been in, almost 20 books in 48 years and 2,400 interviews, 
yes. not counting, you know, producing and all the other things I do. Everybody kind of knows I'm not interested in who who did blow cocaine. I don't care. I don't want to know about it. I'd rather talk to the people about the engineer, like we had mentioned, Fred Catero. Right, Fred, yeah. Do I get some kudos tracking him down to get quotes from him on my Leonard Cohen book because he did some of the first recordings with Leonard? Yes. Did he tell you the story? Thank you. Did he? Tell he you told me the whole story with the mirror and yeah, the whole Michigan. Yeah, I've been. Yeah. I was there pulling that out of him. Yeah. I'd rather hear from the guy that did a demo with Bob Dylan, or shall we say, a microphone test right. under. John Hammond Sr. Uh-huh. of Bob Dylan, and then later worked with Janice, and then later did uh, with John Simon, the circle, red rubber ball, and all that. Right. I'd rather talk to a veteran engineer like him than, than, than hear about crazy rock and roll hi- lifestyle yeah. and heroin and stuff like that. Every, everybody else can do that, go right ahead. I, I have, and if that's an agenda I have, to bring him the technical as opposed to the um, casualty story, sure. then I'll stand by it. Okay. Well, that's how my show is, too. I'm not looking for drama. I'm not looking to start trouble. Um, I just want to know, you know, the, give me the facts, you know, that kind of thing. Also, let me just back up a little. Um, sure. Uh, we, we pretty much came from the same type of um, environment. Uh, mid, I don't know if you were mid, middle class. I was. You know, Jewish families... And um, um, my mother was very involved in music. She wasn't, um, you know, she was a housewife until I got a little older. But um, I remember going through her record collection, and she had a ton of Fats Domino's 45s and um, really, really cool old R&B stuff. Um, Do you think it has something to do with our background that we got involved in music so heavy? Was that pushing? No, no, no doubt about it. I mean... Having a father who died at age 92 seven years ago and a Mm -hmm. mother turning 97 in January, I spent a lot of time with I'm a very lucky person, Uh and I also have a brother that we're not warring siblings. Often do you see see that. But I guess what I'm trying to say, I had a lot of bonus time with my parents talking talking about music. Right. Um, and, you know, it was only 10 years ago that I found out my mother told me that in ni- 1939, uh-huh. she saw Judy Garland when Judy came through Chicago. Wow. She saw Frank Sinatra in 1941-42 at that Paramount Theater when she graduated high school. Brooklyn. Her gift was, yeah, was to go on the the train to go see Sinatra do one of his legendary residencies there. Right. And occasionally, when there's a Frank Sinatra documentary, I do see footage of my mother as a teenage girl because I get phone calls on it. Is that your mother? This woman looks just like you. Oh, and I and and, and so. Um, my parents were music big band people, right. you know, Sinatra, Judy Garland. I've gone to Streisand shows with them. I'm, I'm just saying that. Um, and also, I, they let me watch the Dorsey Brothers show when Elvis Presley was on it in 1956. And the Steve Allen shows with, um, when Dylan was on in 62 or 63. Um, and that's not counting things like the Ed Sullivan show. Plus, I would go to um, the set of the Monkees and other kind of music shows that were uh, shot in Hollywood, yeah. age 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. And I did not have parents who hated rock and roll. Maybe they mm-hmm. didn't like the length of the Beatles' hair, uh-huh. but we watched them on Ed Sullivan, but then again, I saw the Beatles do a quick appearance on the Jack Parr show in '63. Really? Um, from the they had Cavern Club, Club footage, and I've written about that. Mm-hmm. So I did not discover the Beatles like everybody else on off the Ed Sullivan show. I heard some of the music on our local radio station KRLA 
long before New York stations and after Canada did the first airplay of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Um, I, they were not, and I was a be hardcore Beach Boy guy, and um, I mean, I went with my parents to see the Kinks in the mid '70s. They were at least kind of checking it out. I mean, they weren't going to go see Bowie and Mata Hoopa with me, right. but they could kind of grasp that Ray Davies was a songwriter, and it was kind of music, British music hall theater, and um, and also I would, maybe wasn't driving at the time, and you know, um, they would take me to the venue. Or pick me up after they didn't want me hitchhiking, you know, uh, after 1969. Right. A, A, A was illegal in 68 or 69 or 70. Hitchhiking was not illegal then. It was a kind of a cool thing. The bus system hadn't been totally developed, and LA didn't have a subway or an underground. Uh -huh. And you had to go see concerts in downtown LA or at the beach, and it didn't have this. Um, it, it wasn't something out of a, the movie Taken where you could be kidnapped and all that. Those kind of thoughts, didn't we never realized the danger in that world, you yes, know? Yes, yes. Um, things have changed, as your friend Bob Dylan once sang. Right. Now, um, yeah, I used to hitchhike a lot, too, on Long Island. Um, yeah, see, my folks were a little different. My mom was, um, her parents came from Russia. So they came to uh, the States, and, you know, they came, then they, they, they lived in Brooklyn, and, um, um, you know, the Jewish people back then had a very socialistic type of uh, uh, attitude. So I grew up, my mother, you know, was listening to uh, uh, um, Woody Guthrie and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Pete Seeger. And, and Cisco and, Houston and all those kind of yes, people. Yes, and, you know, Deda. And um, those were the records I had in my house. And, um, and when Bob Dylan came out, she kind of embraced him. And it was that kind of a thing. And... Um, they encouraged me. I'm a keyboard player. She encouraged me anyway to play. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a whole um, music meant so much more back then. It was so so much um, intertwined in your daily life that, um, you know, I'm just talking about my existence. I had no other choice but to kind of love it. My dad was an insurance man. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough that one of his clients was the head of security at Madison Square Garden. Hello? Yeah, wow. yeah. So, I mean, I had to pay for the tickets, but I always knew I had them. So, you know, during that, that big year, um, 68, 69, 70, you know, I got to see um, Donovan at the Garden, and then the next month was um, the Rolling Stones, you know, the Yaya's tour. Did you see the Dylan Band concert in 74? Yeah, that was at the Nashville Coliseum, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw um, a Blind Faith that year, 10 years after with Buddy Miles opening at the Garden. Sure. I got to see um, the Bangladesh show. I got to see John Lennon. Oh, that's re that, that is really interesting. You went to the August 71 Bangladesh show, which yeah. has a full chapter in my yep, book, yep, by the yep, way. Yep, yep, yep. And, and, and then wow. I got, then I got to see Lennon at the Garden. The one -to -one, oh, you mean the one-to-one -one concert? The one-to-one, -one, you know, the whole uh, Geraldo Rivera thing. Wow. And that was such a disappointment because uh, he, he, he was kind of off his game that night. Stevie Wonder stole the show at that thing, in my opinion. But anyway, um, you know, Stevie was... Stevie was back. Well, there. you got you know what you got instant karma with him at the piano. I did also. Um, <laughs> also, uh, Stevie Wonder opened up so many wonderful shows back then. He opened for the Stones. I it, saw five Rolling Stone shows on their on their 1972 tour, uh -huh. and Stevie Wonder was the opening act. Yeah, yeah. I was and like, I saw Stevie at the Whiskey, and I interviewed mm -hmm. him, and I went sang with him in San Diego wow. uh, backstage. But those were his... with the warm up group, and you know, it, the world was different then. Yeah. Um. And and there are many theories. My theory is, and I haven't spent a lot of time in this because I just, I mean, we're we're addressing it right now. Right. I think what happened. And I am not blaming MTV on this. I am. Um, well, I'm not blaming them exclusively on this. But once MTV, I mean, I know it kind of shows up in 1978 in some markets, and by 81 it's really rocking, and then it really gets cooking yeah. in the early 80s. I think um, the music became more visual because of the videos, but also artists and recording artists and record companies and people who signed talent they were they've always been kind of youth driven 
Um, but now they became visual, visual guided. And I think musicianship took a slight back, back seat. Well, and all of a sudden, it was kind of, um, if we were looking at some sort of calendar, kind of a BCAD kind of moment. Yeah. I, I kind of think, um, especially after punk rock and new wave, which had some very valuable elements, uh -huh. 76 to 82 or whatever it is, you know. Uh -huh. But I think once the mid-80s thing really happened, I'm talking music TV and other platforms, pre-streaming, pre-everything, and music was seen on TV as opposed to exclusively being experienced live. Or you would catch some music clips on TV shows. I think that changed a lot of things, and that's also not counting that the would-be artists who were children or teenagers or figuring out ways how to get into the music and record business, they became a lot more savvy, more marketing-oriented, yeah. and new words like booking agent and producer and A&R, where, you know, how to get tapes to people, etc. And I think it changed the dynamic. Harvey, um, I, I see two spikes in the music business back then, Woodstock and then MTV. What happened at Woodstock was bands um, stopped playing the Fillmore, venues like the Fillmore, and moved their acts into places like the Garden. I saw Joplin play the Garden with um, Paul, Paul Butterfield opening and Johnny Winter popped up. They That mm -hmm. would have been a, a great, great, great Fillmore show. It kind of got lost at the garden. Bill, Bill Graham and I discussed this one time in a 1976 interview for Melody Maker. Uh -huh. And he said, part of the blame is on me. Um, we could take, after Woodstock, we could take rock and roll and the logistics and our bookings to more arenas and outdoor stadium shows. Right. And also, and he, he didn't use the word blame, but he said something along the lines of, you know, management and especially the musicians could make more money right. playing a bigger venue than three nights in yeah. a row at a smaller venue. Right. So you had that factor as well. Right. And after Woodstock and the movie and the success of the soundtrack albums, and there was subsequent even a volume two, yeah. it showed the world that the youth popular culture could be marketed and there was a demographic that would grab okay. anything to do with that that was the spike that you are initiating in this phone call and that right. is definitely true festival culture really started expanding i'm not talking the right. newport folk festival no. but all of a sudden you had the 60s and early 70s big huge festivals yeah. where the acts were making a bit more money and all of a sudden, you weren't seeing them in the smaller rooms anymore. Right. And then, and then it plays out through the seventies. And then MTV. I don't view them as the enemy, well, but MTV collectively, the mentality, the record company collaboration with them, previewing videos, having exclusives, you know, all that but, kind of stuff. But, but what happened with you know, M what happened with MTV yeah. was, and you know the club I came from, my father's mm -hmm. place. We were paying acts five thousand dollars a night. Okay, you know uh, that was you know a bigger band than whatever. What did, what did the room? How many people did the room hold? Eight hundred. Okay. And it had a bar. Yeah. So okay. So anyway, it held eight hundred. The minute MTV happened, that five thousand dollar fee became seventeen thousand. Shoo. And that's mm -hmm. when we had to start thinking about closing because there was no way an 800 seat, uh, uh, you know, venue was going to be able to cover that kind of a nut. And then at the same time, the drinking age in New York went from 18 to 21. Game over. Yeah. So it kind of that put the final nails in the coffin at the time. And wow. Yeah. So it, it all happened at once. But MTV was the spike that um, kind of went through the vampire's heart, so to speak. And, um, you know, the bands just got out of hand. You know, a band like Squeeze, that was that you know, Elvis Costello, who was getting 5000 next time he came around, wanted 20 You know, it just we couldn't do it. Yes, and that, um, you know, you've given us some answers 
why the um, why things changed and yeah. uh, and and but also what happened and maybe I'm the beneficiary of this possibly um, bands after Woodstock really started not being video artists but they at least started getting filmed or videoed at the film wars in the various places, whether it be home movies yeah. or soundboard recordings that you've had some engineers on your show. Right. So all of a sudden, um, we have footage and archives of memorabilia and artifacts and posters, and this stuff gets available. Sure, it was around in the late 50s and 60s and some scant TV footage. But in the 70s, well into the 80s, and I'm not... Just saying, you know, the band's last waltz and uh, the Mayless Brothers doing Gimme Shelter or right. D.A. Pennybaker doing Bob Dylan's Don't Look Back. All, all these. Right. And the doors were visually oriented. They always made movies and films. At least people started thinking of preservation. I don't think they really thought there'd be movies and DVDs and streaming and Netflix 20, 30, and 40 years ago. But I'm the beneficiary of that because, well, we all are the beneficiaries, but I am for this book because all this ephemera became visual products, initially Betamax or VHS or DVDs mm -hmm. that have been rolled into documentaries, and now I've done a book on documentaries. But, you know, I did an earlier book that touched on the subject at length in 2000. Six um, called Hollywood Shack Job, which was about music supervisors and TV shows right. and the relationship we have with celluloid products. This book is 20 times deeper, and I knew there was an audience in 2006, and now, 14 years later, we see this golden age of the music documentary that's kind of been around the last few years. Mm -hmm. Coupled with Amazon, Hula, streaming platforms, Netflix, um, it used to be you and I had to go see these movies at some midnight movie screening. Right. That world has disappeared, except maybe the la the Rocky Horror Picture Show still has residency. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm here to chronicle, but also introduce people to some really stirring. Um, documentaries that I think they would enjoy. Well, um, why don't you tell everybody where they could uh, find you and your books before, the, the, uh, the, before well, we forget? Go to Amazon and you can check out Docs That Rock, Music That Matters. There's an order link and a whole deal. All the information is there. And, uh, and um, great, great, yeah. great, great articles on you on uh, Wikipedia. You're a star on Wikipedia. Yeah, and I don't even, I've never, I just glanced at my Wikipedia page, which I never created. Uh -huh. yeah, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and by the way, to show you how lax I am in social media and yeah. how much I'm not a non-promoter, uh -huh. I've never updated the Wikipedia. It stops like at book four. Uh -huh. so, okay. so if you think I'm a self-promoter, I think I've missed a really good opportunity here. Yeah, I know, I know. You've got um, a lot more books than that. Um, but mm -hmm. you were an A&R &R man for record companies. Yes, I was, and, um, you know, um, for 11 and a half months, I was West Coast Director of A&R for MCA Records mm -hmm. from 1978 to 79. Right. Um, I had some good times there, and I had a lot of frustrations there. Uh, frustrations meaning trying to sign talent where sure. the lack of belief by key company people was not there. I tried to sign the knack to MCA records. Right. And uh, cuz I saw them early, a, a, a good friend of mine was the drummer. Uh -huh. And I was told quit trying to get your friends deals. Well. And I accepted that and uh, I was they later signed to Capitol Records after uh, you know, uh, right. one a couple of my bosses didn't see it at a showcase. And I was invited to the uh, My Sharona recording session, <laughs> coincidentally done at MCA Whitney Studios. Wow. And I, I have a platinum record for My Sharona. Beautiful. So I, I, uh, that was an interesting little uh, endeavor. But I think the most important thing I did 
at MCA Records, among many things, and I'm talking about, um, you know, the ramifications of involvement or the impact of decisions I made. Mm -hmm. It's pretty well documented now. It was sort of hidden under the carpet for a few decades. Um, I knew Jimmy Iovine in 1975 when he was an engineer. Right. He'd worked on Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run album. Yeah. I met him in 1975, knew he was a super talent uh, before he sort of went into production, and I actually did a full-page interview with him in Melody Maker in 1975. Okay. And then in 1978, I was hanging out with him one night, and this is long before he's at Apple Music and all this kind of stuff, right. and he indicated to me that he was a fan of Tom Petty. Uh -huh. He had seen him at the bottom line. And I said, that's interesting, because I, I know Tom from interviewing him. I, I know his manager, who I met in 1975, Tony Mitriotis. Um, Tom is actually looking for a, a producer for his third album since MCA, the parent company, had bought an ABC Records and some of the Shelter Records catalog. And I met with Jimmy. I even flew to New York and met him at where he was living. And I suggested that Jimmy produce this album, which was soon to become Damn the Torpedoes. Right. And I was initially greeted with Harvey, he's just an engineer. And I said, well, he's co-produced uh, Southside Johnny's album with uh, Stephen Van Zandt. He's done a Golden Earring album for MCA Records. Yeah. Uh, I think he worked with Return to Forever. He was becoming this producer, or had had some production credits. Right. And um, I didn't really feel the support there. And then I was dismissed, along with many other people, in a company reduction. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks later, um, he signs to produce Tom Petty's Damn the Torpedo albums. Oh. Um, and um, it's not lost on me. And there's a Warren Zanes book out now on Tom Petty where a manager gives me the credit for making that suggestion. Now, Tom Petty never forgot that for two things. In 2014, he wrote the lengthy introduction to my book, Turn Up the Radio, Pop Rock and Roll in Los Angeles, 1956 to 1972. Yeah. Plus, during my MCA tenure, I made the suggestion, and it did become fulfilled, that Tom produce a record with Del Shannon because Tom was a fan of classic rock people. I introduced him to Carl Perkins. I mean, I knew him yeah. when he first came to town. I would do interviews at the Shelter Records office on Hollywood Boulevard and, and all that. And eventually Tom did produce an album on Del Shannon, Drop Down and Get Me. Great album. It came out on the Network Electra rec uh, label. Yep. Great album. And, my credit on the, and the credit on the album is Harvey Kubernick, Organic Catalyst. Uh -huh. Wow. So, so you can see that's part of my, and I work with John Hyatt. I produced a spoken word record on John Hyatt at MCA. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, you know, I had some big plans for the label. They were dashed, um, and then I, you know, did what I, I'm still doing. Sure. So that was my, um, you know, I've been in and out of some record companies, but. Um, I'm very proud of that achievement, and it's only now, sadly, due to the physical passing of Tom Petty, that this this Jimmy Iovine and this Tom Petty pairing keeps getting brought up to me. But I should also say, at this very moment, I'm serving as consulting producer on an authorized Del Shannon documentary, and Del's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And recently, uh, for the documentary, I interviewed... Ben Montench, the keyboardist of Tom Petty's Heartbreakers, mm -hmm. and Seymour Stein wow. of Sire Records Sire fame, Records, and yeah. um, and also Jeff Lynn is committed, and Sir Tim Rice is committed, wow. and Andrew Lug Oldham has signed to narrate this documentary, which is in production. Wow. So all these kind of, you'll find out in life, things you did and investments you made 2, 5, 10, 30, 40, 50 years ago, can come back to help you, occasionally haunt you, right. but also they do help 
steer you on the path you're on. They do. So, so the, so the, the involvement at MCA Records and meeting somebody like Dan Burgoyes, who was Del Shannon's best friend, mm -hmm. manager for 35 years, to this day still oversees Del's estate. Yeah. He's the one who recommended me to work on the Del Shannon documentary this year. Beautiful. So, um, these things occasionally, rock and roll doesn't betray you, but it can fortify you. One sentence. Um, you know, I spoke to Phil Jones, uh, Tom's drummer, for, you know. Yes. And um, he only has great things to say about um, uh, Tom. You know, what, what a it's, a, it's become a hard one for me because when I say hard, yes, it's rewarding. Yeah. When I say hard, I guess I should use the word sad, yeah. because right now I am actively working with the Tom Petty estate right. on this um, Del Shannon documentary. They've graciously allowed um, usage of um, some segments from Tom Petty's uh, Sirius XM radio show, Buried Treasures, right. and and again, lined up interviews with, with people, and I am... I wouldn't want to say back in touch with, but you know you're you're working with estates now, or you're working with people that that come out of Tom's management, where I hadn't um, had much dealings with for a long time. Right. But everybody realizes. I mean, even when I did the Ben Montench interview a while ago, and I've known him over the decades, um, but I hadn't seen him in many years, and he came to the interview. Um, because he was a fan of Dell and he played, you know, the Heartbreakers and Tom had jammed with Dell a bunch of times or Dell had joined them at some gigs and things like that. Yeah. And I just, uh, we looked at each other and we both of said, this is a long way from Shelter Records on Hollywood Boulevard, yep. practically getting mugged at Pioneer Chicken one evening. <laughs> and, um, he you know, we laughed because he knows and I know, um, Tom and this band had just kind of come to town, and uh, I'm never comparing Shelter Records to anything like the old 42nd Street in New York a half a century ago. Good old days. But it was, it was kind of seedy, yeah, shall yeah, we it was, say. It was. And, and so when you see Tom Petty's migration from Hollywood and Western out here to living in the Valley with his first wife, Jane, and then ending up living in Malibu... Right. Um, it's an interesting, I was sort of witness to, um, to his journey and, um, yeah. and, and so, um, now because of him writing the introduction to this book, which never has gotten really mentioned in any of the obituaries or tribute stories for him. And I'm not kvetching, right. um, because I'm the one who gets the emails through a publisher did Tom Petty write something for a book you did? Yeah. Because that information hasn't really been positioned through the Internet or web or the Petty fan clubs. I think you know what I'm talking about. Sure. You don't realize that his first ever and only long-form introduction with his name on the front cover um, was something that I did six years ago. I'm not coming across like I'm angry about it, but because it's not information that's readily available, yeah. people are now sort of doing the math since he died because, sadly, uh, death propels coverage and legacy yeah. and articles and Internet stuff. And now I'm getting these trickling things and being asked about Tom Petty. Right. And I'm delighted to do it. I don't really initiate it. Right. But it becomes part of my life, too, Um augmented by this Del Shannon excursion that I'm on as well. Right. Well, I don't know how much time you have. I have a thousand questions. To Keep ask. going. Okay. Well, keep going. Okay. Uh, people don't remember Shelter Records, and they don't remember that Tom was involved with Shelter Records. Um, you know, that was a great label. They did some great work in their day. and um, I think Shelter Records, and especially the teaming of Denny Cordell and Leon Russell, Yep are one overlooked combo in the history of rock and roll. Okay, let me take you I, back. I, 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 inter I interviewed Dwight Twilley at uh -huh. Shelter Records. I like all the J.J. Kale stuff. I, uh -huh. think, I think Leon Russell is still one of the most unsung hero and sound architects in the history of music. Me too. 
Me too. And, and also, shelter, let, let, and let shelter. Me, let me yeah, just take so you back. It was a Hollywood label. It's a, a label that's on Hollywood Boulevard. People are living in Southern California, and there's a little bit of a Southern twang to some of the product on that label. But it, I'm telling you, those first half a dozen Leon Russell records, uh-huh. I still play. I do too. And, um, you know, it was the Wrecking Crew. You know, Leon came out of the Wrecking Crew. But let me take you back one step. I'm friendly with Mark Benno. Do you remember Mark? Mark Benno, yeah, he did your show, and he, he, he was on the Asylum Choir with Leon, yes. on, I think, on AM Records and all that. Yes. Yeah, two, two albums. And, and Mark Benno played on a Doors album, too, I think you recall. Yes, L.A. Woman. That's what I wanted to talk mm-hmm. to you about. Um, according to Mark, he was... Um, he walked into a crazy situation with the doors that it was utter chaos and you know he, yes you know he kind of pulled them all together speaking to Robbie Robbie said that uh, um, Mark didn't do very much on the album you know he wasn't the big you know savior of the day do you know anything about that do you know well I know one thing I think Mark Mark's Mark's influence and contributions are very important because I think it also freed Robbie up to play more lead guitar. Okay. Um, also, you're dealing with a, a, a band that had um, separated from their record producer, Paul A. Rothschild, and Bruce Botnick was now not only the engineer, right, but, right, you know, right, co-producing. Right. And I think Mark Benno provided kind of a little bit of a calming agent. Um, so he was like the, the Billy, doors that, yeah, he was the that, Billy that, Preston then, huh? Yeah, and remember one thing, when Billy Preston walked into the Let It Be world, everybody starts getting on their best behavior when there's a new guest in the house. And I think that happened as well. And the Doors always had used different bass players, Larry Nectel early on. Um, Lonnie uh, Lonnie Brooks? Actually, Harvey Brooks. Harvey Brooks. Um, And and so that that was part of it, but... um, I'm a big, you know, I I like the Doors a lot. I've written extensively about them. I saw the original group. Me too. I'm. Uh, what, what can I tell you? I, if you want to go on a Doors Jack, I'm I'm right here. But um, the music is timeless. I know that sounds sort of predictable to say. Yeah. Uh, Jim Morrison's lyrics and Robbie's lyrics very prophetic. Yeah. They were like warning signals of the chaos we're currently in right now. They definitely were. And 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 um they were good live, they were great live on occasion, but yeah. it was kind of a jazz rock group. It wasn't m- monumental every time. But thank I, God there's enough recordings and live albums and material out there. And so I'll take all of it. I saw the doors at the Felt Forum. And um, I remember it was the Alabama song. It's on the album, you know, they, they released the yes. album. But I remember yes. I was very, very young, and it was the first time I actually heard a band screw up on stage. They started the Alabama song two or three times till they finally got it right. But that's also the beauty of the Doors, yes. because there was a lot of improv. It yep. wasn't rehearsed. Uh, Morrison would go off book, as they say. Yeah. And... You never quite know because not every performance sounds the same, and you you went on this ride with them. Yeah, and um, sure, you know Morrison uh, had his agenda, which was made up on the spot. Right, but you had somebody like Ray Manzarek who at least you know kept the troops cooking, yeah. and that combination of John Densmore and Robbie Krieger and Ray with Jim um, was sort of unbeatable. And I have to tell you, you play the music now, and it doesn't really seem very dated. It doesn't and, at all. Um, and and um, the good thing is about the Doors, I, I no longer have to stick up for them at parties or events and hearing what a buffoon Jim was later in his life and career. Right. Um, owing partially to the Oliver Stone movie or or just the books on Jim Morrison. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew a different guy based on the records, and I saw it very early. And I'm also a guy that went briefly to a, a, a high school in summer 
where like John Densmore went. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I, I briefly, I went to UCLA Extension. That's where Ray and Jim graduated UCLA. Right. Right. I have a little bit of academic history, at least being on the campuses of members of that band. Uh, to me, that means something. Uh, I know it sounds kind of trite to people, but at least I, I have an idea of the academic world they came out of. And right. I think, um, that it's part of the glue that brings me in, you know, to writing and, and, and wanting to know more about them. And another, another, um, not tragedy, but another, um, uh, thing that has to be pointed out about the doors is that, um, um, you know, um, Ray got a lot of credit. You know, he was the keyboard bass player, you know, the, you know, the um, keyboard bass. And Jim, obviously, was the leader of the band. But Robbie, Robbie was the brains behind that band, if you think about it. Well, Ray Manzarek has said more than once, and it's um, in many articles I've written, and it might be in the Doors chapter that I have in this Docs That Rocks book. Uh-huh. Ray has always said the secret weapon of the Doors was Robbie Krieger as a yep. songwriter. Yep. Whether it be love, let my fire, uh, you know, love me two times. Yeah. I mean, that's sinful. not hidden. Yeah, yeah. By the way, that's not hidden. No. And and nobody kind of knew he was this songwriter whiz when they first got together, yeah. and that's part of the blend. But I think over the years, due to record album credits and interviews, people realize that. See, the band, the Doors were a true democracy. Right. Um, partially because the music publishing was a four-way split. Right. Um, it isn't a Beatles situation where Harrison had his own publishing division and Lennon McCartney songs were published by, you know, Dick James Music or something. Yeah. So the music publishing was a split where a John Densmore and everybody would share equally on some revenue. Right. That's different than than bands led by a singer songwriter, or even you know Mick and Keith and the Rolling Stones, who did ninety eight percent of the songwriting, yeah. where Charlie Watts didn't didn't share as a in the music publishing. I'm, I'm sure he's not complaining, no. but the Doors Morrison knew he needed the Doors, and the Doors knew they needed Jim, and therefore it was five. It was only five years, but like Jimi Hendrix, which was kind of four years, look at the amount of work that was done in that less than a half a decade period. Oh, it was crazy. It was insanity. Look at and we, and we, we have the music and these audio treasures and visual items. Yeah. And, and that's, again, another reason why my book is doing well and leading me to all kinds of new people. See, I'm in it for the ride. Right. It brings me to people like you and all kinds of other people. On top of it, it's not. I'm not a product of traditional media coverage. Um, the Los Angeles Times, my local paper, has never reviewed any of my 19 books. Yeah. Um, my Sirius XM radio last, interview last week was done with two people in New York. Right. I'm talking to you, I believe, in New Mexico. Um, I'm um, so, and I'm not complaining about it. But I'm, I, people, this thing is really starting to pick up some momentum or visibility. And I'm not a byproduct of Rolling Stone magazine. I think they've blurbed one of my books in 20 years. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm not, I'm not angry and mad at anybody. But I'm kind of showing that the migration and the exposure to my catalog and who I am is happening um, a little different. Than, uh, organically and not the usual hometown guy right. gets hometown support. And I also know very early in my life, whether it be my studies of the American Indian or studying and knowing jazz and blues artists, and I'm talking about Los Angeles, and it might have been Ben Webster, or I think it was really Lester Young, mm-hmm. who said to the music journalist Stanley Dance many decades ago, no one likes hometown. Okay. And you've seen many artists go to New York or Paris or England because they can't get bookings or the respect in their hometown. Okay. So, like, like even on this Friday... 
I'm doing a couple of hours on Coast to Coast AM with uh, the host Ian Punnett. Oh. There's 500 AM radio stations in that syndicate. Wow. He's, I believe, based in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm saying, things happen the way they're supposed to happen. The word organic is often used. And I'm delighted just to see it roll out and connect with people. And however it goes down, it goes down. Yeah. And um, I, I've just written a book with my brother on Jimi Hendrix for Sterling Barnes & Noble. That will be out in September of 2021. It was delayed due to the pandemic. Sure. And I, anybody, you're wasting your time thinking or saying why another book on Jimi Hendrix? I wouldn't do it if I didn't deliver, and this one's with my brother, a really revealing and fascinating music-themed, music-centric study of Jimi Hendrix like we've never seen before. Beautiful. From the 50 photos that I found, many never seen, to the 20 or 25 interview subjects that have never discussed Jimi, um, it's a really good book. I'm, I'm very happy uh, about it. And I got a lot of confidence assembling the book, writing it with my brother, doing the photo, licensing, finding the memorabilia. Um, it sort of empowered me to plunge into um, this current documentary book. Yeah. Um, and I don't have to worry. About, I don't have to worry about the next book. The next yeah. book is sort of done already. And I'm sure you know who his last um, live performance was with, right? His la you, you mean you mean the Isla White one or no, the one no, no, in no. Germany? No, no, um, with War. Well, oh yeah, at Ronnie Scott at Ronnie, Ronnie Scott's Scott, club when yeah. he jammed. I, we, I, he jammed I, the I, I just spoke to Lee Oscar a few nights ago, and he was telling me. About wow. The show. Yeah. Yeah. Allegedly, there's footage of that that's never come out. I know. I spoke to him about that. Uh, there's yeah. been some. Um, there's been some Michigash as far as licensing or something. Yeah. I I think he played twice at Ronnie Scott's in that stint. The last show and mm -hmm. maybe the day before. Uh, there's a woman in my book who attended one of those shows, and she does a sidebar, look talking about his last. Uh, appearance. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So, and she's never been public about that. And again, it's anecdotal. It's music. I mean, one of the mantras I I've been employing the last couple of decades regarding the music work I do, and I'm really talking about the articles and the magazine features, but it pertains to the books I do. I um. Dr. James Cushing, who's just retired from the uh, San Luis Obispo English and Liter Literature Department, and he's been a disc jockey on the radio for 30 years on Pacifica and places out out, uh -huh. out here. Uh -huh. You know, when I when he 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 said something to me that was really um, really powerful. I didn't need it as a directive. I needed it a little bit, I think, for reinforcement. He is quoted often in some of my books, and um, he said to me, it isn't nostalgia if you're delivering new information. Okay. And I think when you read my books, and this one, and yep. you go back to my book on Leonard Cohen, uh -huh. uh, my book on 1967, take a look at all my books. Well, that's how I opened, but the, that's how yeah, I opened, so there, so, that, that's yeah. how I opened your segment, that... Um, Pick up this book. You're going to read things about people that you think you know that you have no idea about. Anyways, I'm all for today's young people uh -huh. because some of them are either jealous of me, but a lot of them envy me, and a lot of them look to me for guidance and support and help. Yes. I've even written letters of recommendation for people to get into graduate film schools. Uh -huh. Some of the places that would never let me in. Right. That being said, um, and I got this from the poet actor Harry E. Northup. He's been in 30 movies, including Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, uh -huh. Silence of the Lambs, has 10 books of poetry out. He's a dear friend of mine. Okay. And he said to me, you have an advantage over most of these people getting these book deals who are in their 20s and 30s. And it's not really an age thing because you're in your 60s. Right. 
And I said, what's the advantage? I mean, I kind of think the advantage is I saw all these people. I've known them. And he said, you offer firsthand information. You lived it. Thank you. And he said, you do that, they can't. And he asked me, do not spend time being angry. My mother told me revenge is a wasted emotion because I watched them get big book deals and far greater advances sometimes than I ever get. But the bottom line is they fail on the page. And by the way, mazel tov to everybody because what happens, the cream rises to the top or people usually find on occasion Uh the real deal. Right. And so it's one of the reasons I do what I do. And but I know when you read my book, you actually I actually set scenes that bring you in, and I know it's it something is happening because I'm emerging as this Southern California, Los Angeles, Hollywood guide to the real uh, pop culture terrain of this town. Well, let me tell you. I, I, I'm getting. I'm just based that on fan mail and emails, but I know based on our conversation today and some of the media outlets, not counting some of these reviews you've seen, um, that that people are truly embracing my archive and my catalog. And now I'm going into some venues, and the beauty of it is, at the moment, there's no literary agent, there's no lawyers, there's no manager. There's no, there's none of that stuff. It, it truly is happening the way people used to find out about a band or an English record import or hearing something on some Alice and Steel Nightbird FM radio broadcast, and you know sure. exactly what I'm talking about. I love those. And and I think that's just this is some sort of lubrication that is really goosing things forward because. We there's so much insanity and chaos and non-truths around us that once in a while, and you can get that on on stage when you see some of your favorite artists play, but I'm giving it to you in a book. Right. And I just want to let you know, guys out there, um, I I got the book Music That Matters, and um, I picked it up, and I started leafing through it when I first got it. And, uh, you know, I said to myself, man, it's a lot of reading in this book. And um, I just kind of jumped into it, and I wasn't able to put it down. It's just incredible. There's some great photos in it, which, you know, it's great to see the photos. But the actual, actual, um, the way it's broken up into, um, how you just open it up. The Doors, live at the Bowl, 68. Um, live at the Isle of Wight doors, and I mean, you don't have to read it in order. You could skim through it. You could do what you want to do, but there's something in here for everybody. From uh, you know, from well, part of part part of it is I have a very cool publisher, Travis Pike at Other World Cottage Industries, who not only has a chapter in this book himself and has had many books put out and, and published other people, and as a fifty or sixty year veteran of the film and music business. But one of the deals I cut with him yeah. is I could make this book as long as I want, yeah. and there would be no censorship or interference. And the book is 508 pages. You even wrote about Murray Lerner. Uh, just in a- well, but remember one thing about Murray Lerner. I first had a contact with him in 1972 as exactly. a college student, yep. and I and his office sent me uh, his movie festival to show to a rock literature class that I sort of was a TA on uh-huh. at San Diego State University. <clears throat> and uh, the film arrived to my dorm room in 1972. Uh-huh. Um, and it's not lost on me that um, he had to develop a syndication circuit, and he was really filming, you know, Isla White stuff, and he was filming uh, Dylan at Newport and, and doing a lot of these things. And his, his contributions were never lost on me. So when I had the forum to do articles, um, like interviewing him about a Leonard Cohen live, live at Isle of Wight that came out in 2009, or 
for this book, I, I think I did three different interviews with him, and my brother and I hosted an event with him at a, a Mods and Rockers festival at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood, where we showed some of his movies, um, and Andrew Lou Goldman was there that night uh, for one of the Who films. You realize that that's 48 years ago. Right. And I and I and I made sure to give Murray a chapter in this book, and and also ask him about blocking and staging and film stock, as well as filming uh, Dylan and Hendrix and everybody. And um, I mean, I think it's a really good mixture of emerging filmmakers, uh, people of color. That's this term people keep bringing up to me. Yeah. Female directors. That's people keep saying that to me. There's so many women directors in your book. Um, and then I, I have to say to everybody, you know, there's a woman named Linda Snyder that did the front cover and the back cover of this book. Right. I have never met her, emailed her, or spoken to her. Uh, Travis said, what are we doing for the cover? And I said, here are the colors I want, and I want a mixture of rhythm and film on the cover, some kind of film stuff, and that's it. And it came back to me. So I, I don't have to have committee meetings and think about exclusion, inclusion writers or identity politics or thinking, do we have enough women in this book? I can't even conceive of that. When the Mashiach crosses the Mississippi, then I'll think about stuff like that. Oh, yeah, really. Um, you know what I mean? So yes. I'm just saying I was drawing on a catalog that goes back 44 years. I brought in newcomers. I I found some skill, some films, um, you know, as an A&R kind of guy doing the forensic work. But I also... Um, I was fortunate to talk to D.A. Pennybaker six or seven times over 19 years wow. about his his films like Monterey Pop and Dylan's Don't Look Back. And so, um, sadly, Murray Lerner and Albert Mazelis and, and D.A. Pennybaker have left this in the physical, right. and I'm, I carry on the mission to expose their library and work. Okay. Now, I wanted to bring this up, um, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes ago when we're talking about Jimi Hendrix, I just want to get it out there real quick. Um, I've become friendly with um, John Altman, the uh, composer, director. Do you know John? Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. John told me a story that back in the 60s, um, he was um, music director for Van Morrison for a while, but prior to that, he was on stage playing saxophone, and the band consisted of Jimi Hendrix on bass, and um, um, uh, Peter Green on lead guitar. And he's looking for a tape of that. He said there might be one floating around. Was it, a, was it a jam at a New York club or something? It was in the U.K. In the U.K., wow. Yeah, can you imagine that? Now, there is a Hendrix Information Society. I've never really um, interacted with them, yeah. per se, but I think it's out there. Yeah. I've worked with the Hendrix Estate and... Also, um, the gent who publishes the Voodoo Child newsletter, uh -huh. the hen uh, kind of like on the Hendrix Information Management. Uh, but I've never even, if it happened, it would be in, in London, of course. Yes. Um, well, you know, John Altman's a legitimate guy. He He's the guy who yeah. did the secret policeman's over the ball. He yes. was involved with all that stuff and, and uh, just a, hundreds and hundreds and thousands. He's done over 4,000 commercials. You know, but he, you know, the Titanic was his, uh, he's just an amazing man. And um, he said he, you know, he, he's been looking and looking and searching. He just can't seem to get his hands on Yeah, I can't, this is one I can't help you on. Let's just say there's a regional uh, great story, though, divide right? that. Is that a great story? <laughs> Tremendous story, but that's the thing about Jimmy. He was always jamming, too. Yep. Um, and, oh, and that's the beauty. Yeah, and that's the beauty of of Jimi Hendrix. Um, there, we're always getting a yearly authorized retail product from him, done closely with the estate and, and John McDermott and especially engineer producer Eddie Kramer. Right. We are still hearing new Jimmy stuff that is finding us. I know. And and and, I, and just like we're hearing unreleased Frank Zappa things that are being yes. uh, delivered, and that is one of the I wouldn't want to call it the benefits of the pandemic, but I think it's made everybody 
go more internal, examine yeah. their their mortality. Yep. But more important, since there's no touring all year, and and releases have been delayed, people are mining their catalogs. Archives. We have the kink. We have the kink 50th anniversary of the Lola album next yep. month. We have all these 50 year markers right. coming out, um, and to me. If there is a benefit of everybody in this landlock circumstance or we have to deal with some form of confinement, right. people are still trying to earn a dollar with reissues or yes. selling music catalog or repurposing <laughs> product. <laughs> I, uh, I've been talking to Trey Gunn from uh, uh, King Crimson and all that fun stuff. Yes. 7D Meteors is a record company. He's been, yes. <laughs> he's been baking his old cassettes. Of course, a lot of you know a lot of the um, uh, tape, um, the oxide of the tape disintegrates. Yes, yes, yes. So he's been uh, so he went on and bought a dehydrator. Wow! So every time I talk to him, he's baking tapes and eating dried fruit. So <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so um, everybody is going into their catalog. I I have this luxury of interviewing. People like in 1974, David Ruffin of the Temptations, wow. 1975, Ernie Isley of the Isley Brothers, 1975, Bobby Rogers of Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Wow. I'm able to use those interviews that I either did for Melody Maker or the Hollywood Press or the Los Angeles Free Press or Crowd Any Magazine. I'm able to use those things and use little bits and pieces of them in the books that I'm doing. Really? And, and, and that's, my all of a sudden, and part of this I can attribute to the emergence of the internet and the web twenty five years ago, whenever that was. Okay. The first um, part of my creative life, I would never use the word career. I could never plan this. I never wanted any of this. I never had any dreams of any of this happening. Um, the first fifteen or twenty years were done before the web and the internet. Um. And what has happened because of the web and the internet and libraries and syndication outfits or, you know, uh, people going on Google or whatever, articles I did in the 70s and even into the 80s, largely for magazines that are now defunct. Remember, this is a pre-online mentality. Correct. They're now either on fan websites or collectors are blogging, and they're crediting or attributing things to me and I'm finding myself on occasion not this year because of the pandemic sure. but occasionally some record geek or some you know cool guy will come up with me to sign an article on a, that's all yellow now from 42 years ago yeah. that he had in his dorm room and now he's 60 years old or something you know yeah. and and um my work from back then because I was asking questions, I didn't think there would be a second or third life to them, but I wasn't asking the traditional questions of just people plugging new releases or looking for kink or juicy titillation anecdotes. I was able to um, talk to the... Um, the the Motown people and the Funk Brothers, the musicians, or yeah, I saw that. the music or the singers I mentioned to you earlier, uh -huh. and I was and I got some very unique road stories from them and cautionary tales of racism and victimhood that I was able to put in chapters like of Dick Clark in this new book, and so uh -huh. it all becomes very topical right now because very little has changed in the last half century. Nothing's changed. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're going to have to um, answer this question. I, cause, I mean, you happen. I just want to let you know something. This is one of the most enjoyable um, interviews I've had so far. Uh, you're just a wealth of knowledge. You're, you're, you're a treasure. Uh, what's going to happen with um, touring and stuff in this COVID world we're living in? Interesting because I would never say I'm a victim of the de of the pandemic, but even Harvey Kubernick had a little bit of a tour lined up 
to talk about this book at film schools. Well, guess what? Everybody went Zoom, yeah. no students on campus, right. and some of the, I would hesitate to call them bookings, but let's just say paid personal appearances um, have gotten postponed or delayed. I mean, one of the marketing aspects of this book, if we're going to use that term, uh -huh. was for me to return to some film schools as this book will find its way to be on required reading lists in music, sociology, cultural classes, and especially film schools. Right. I mean, that will happen a little later this year and next year sure. if the world kind of returns to some kind of rhythm. So that's just my little small part that I have had to well, I decided to write even more stuff and do more articles and work on another book and shepherd this Hendrix book to the retail outlets um, instead of, um, you know, you know, us doing this interview on the road at UC Berkeley or UC Santa Barbara or something in some film school, right? Right. Um, as far as touring and what's going to happen for the future, I think you're going to have more of those house concerts People need to monetize. Right. They need they need income. Um, you're going to be seeing. I mean, if you want me to put on my industry cap as some kind of pundit, uh, as Coach John Wooden of the UCLA basketball uh, team used to say, I don't give advice; I give opinions. Okay. So I have some opinions here. Um, some may play out. Some might work. I'm, you're going to see more artists than Bob Dylan and and Stevie Nicks start selling their music catalogs. Okay? Yes. Um, that's going to be happening more than ever. I know it for a fact. I know people in negotiations. People are reaching age 70 and re age 80 in this rock and roll lifestyle. Um, and so it's time to kind of cash out the way independent record labels were sold to conglomerates. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Because of things like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I don't want to have a discussion on, on that, um, that world. I know very little about it. I um, have never attended any of the ceremonies. But I have, a thing, I have a feeling that once you go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it can help your touring career because I've seen the increase in bookings and and advance fees right. or deposits, and you know all about that world. Sure. As soon as you get that trophy that you're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it and it benefits. It used to benefit, I think, more the blues and R and B acts that a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer could play a casino or come to a college. You, you know what I'm talking about. Right. Um, right, right. um that doesn't exist anymore, and I think what happens when you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you have a career that is a minimum of 25 years, the groups will either regroup for that Get Back Together album of the original participants, yeah. or, or once you are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you have the one to two box sets and the multi-disc live album collection, I think, I don't think it's retirement but I think you start thinking of other things to do. You either focus more on songwriting, hoping your tunes. You focus more on songwriting, hoping your tunes get covered, or you go into a period of self-inflection, or you travel more if you can travel with the flights and everything. But I don't know if we'll see the return of festival culture for a year or two. Um, I know Elton John has already booked a 2022 world tour to begin in New Zealand, which has a very scant rate of the virus, by the way. Right. Um, but I do think um, it's kind of an end for some groups because of age and the fragility and the physicality of touring. Right. And But I also think you're going to see very unique, people making concert films in their own living rooms or documentaries uh, chronicling this period of self-reflection. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, 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 the arena world and the outdoor festival culture world, 
I think it's really at a standstill. However, rock and roll usually has a way of sort of reinventing itself, but Mother Nature and viruses have gotten in the way here. And maybe we'll see more benefit concerts yeah. or people in the rock community taking the message of George Harrison and Ravi Shankar in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason I'm very passionate about um, the concert for Bangladesh, not because I sort of share birthday with George Harrison, who I interviewed, and Ravi Shankar, who I interviewed. Um, That's a very important event and movie and soundtrack. And, And it came out of the perils of starvation and floods and famine you know, in India, where Ravi Shankar approached his friend, uh, you know, George Harrison to help out a bit. And look what it started. And it had the influence on Live Aid and a lot yeah. of things. And I actually think, see, I don't think when you went to the concert of Bangladesh at age 14 or whatever you were, mm-hmm. you were there to see a Beatle. You got to see Bob Dylan reemerge. Yep. But that event has made a lifelong impression on you. It has, and you know what? Um, am, I, am I am I saying the right thing? You no, agree? You definitely are. I mean, it was it brought us all together, and um, you knew what you were going for because you know uh, George was on TV. You know he was on the news. You know night after night prior running up to it. Um, after the show, um, you know there was a lot of press. I think a million dollars was sent over to Bangladesh, which was. Big money in those days. Two hundred and forty-three thousand initially, and they're yeah. still. Yeah. And now there's all kinds of nonprofit and right. new right. Harrison Estate, you know, govern yep. revenue streams happening. Yep. Yes. Yep. And um, you know, um, I got to see Ravi Shankar, who, um, you know, it was like my, one of my. Fr- it was prior to reggae music in, in America. There was really no world music being played at that time. So it was my introduction to Indian music, which I learned. And listen, love. it Ravi Shankar, who who was big in L.A. in Laurel Canyon music community, yeah. going back to sixty five, sixty six. I mean, he opened in sixty seven. Yeah, uh, he was involved in opening, um, you know, a music school in Los Angeles. You right. know, right. on Robertson Boulevard, um, the Canara School of Music, which. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, which John Densmer and Ravi Krieger used to attend to. That's right. I was yeah, actually, so, yeah. It's actually, it was down the street from my Hebrew school and up really? the street from the Kabbalah Center. Oh, wow. I was in some spiritual nerve, let me tell you something, on Pico and Robertson in the 60s, let me tell you. Yeah. And um, what I'm saying is, because of that, I then... I discover Indian food and Indian girls because of <laughs> Ravi Shankar. <laughs> well, Hello. I remember, yeah, I remember Ravi at the concert. Um, I don't know if it made the movie. Uh, I saw it did. Of- I know what you're going to say. We're just tuning up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if you love us tuning, you're going to really love it when we start playing. R- right. And again, Ravi Shankar. Pl- I mean, Henry Diltz pointed this out to me, and Chris Darrow, uh, one of my mentors, pointed this out to me that the sitar had a little bit in common with these guys that came out of playing the banjo, yeah, right? Because of the stringed instrument and all that. And so the folkies and the, you know, the world beat people, we'll, call, we'll use that term, uh-huh. um, they started picking up on Indian music and Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan and right. the percussion aspect of the music school out here and Ravi Shankar closing D.A. Penny Baker's Monterey Pop movie. Yeah. Um, and, George all Harrison, of it, and George Harrison and, and uh, Brian Jones bringing it on to uh, well, well, yes, music. we yeah. start hearing uh, mm-hmm. the sitar and the Beatles' Norwegian Wood, and, yeah. and we start hearing Brian Jones playing on the Stones' Mother's Little Helper and Paint It Black. And then, uh, and, uh, then Roger McGuinn had the electric sitar, the, you know, the uh, Rickenbacker that he played. Exactly, yeah. and, and you know, and so all these factors come into play, and. Um, that's why I think hopefully we'll see, except there's a difference. We are living in a world where there's a lot of greedy people. Right. We are living in a world where there's a lot of self-censored people, self-centered people. Not everybody. I'm all for people making a dollar, capitalism. It's groovy, not a problem. But, 
you and I know, going back to the 60s and the 70s, there was a little bit of brotherhood and sisterhood and teamwork and big picture thinking where it wasn't exclusively about the dollar. Right. And we weren't, you know, the, the focus in the media was on the music, uh, the record labels, the musicians, the singers, the writers, and the poets. Now we're getting tons of stories on marketers, streaming services, rights owners, lawyers being quoted. I'm not saying that's bad, okay? But the focus is on distribution and exhibition uh, more than it is on the people making the music. Well, I bring this up with every musician I speak to. What's more important now, being a talented musician or knowing where to put your hashtags when you are on social media? And I will say one thing, and I have witnesses to this. My concern and goal object is to keep getting better as a writer. Part of it is I got my first book deal at age 51. Um, and I'm not lamenting that. Um, and so the it showed up. Maybe we'll say a little late in the game, but it shows up when it shows up. Right. But I do know one thing, because I have enough fans and people, you know, I run into, and people that I go back a half a century with, and some really hardcore writer, authors, poets, I mean, like, beyond PhD people that have published textbooks and been involved in that world. They all are applauding the growth in my writing not just the interview acumen but the writing i have and also i do something in my books and other people do it but i think it's one of the the strong ligaments in the whole you know running game i'm doing is i employ the multi-voice narrative in my book i bring in two to five to ten people sometimes on a story or a chapter. I like weaving in other people if they have history or something anecdotal to say. And it's just like adding, you know, olives and garlic on top of the pizza, not just one topping. And I think you get all those flavors when you check out my books. And I, I, I've written things, you know, strictly in first person. But um, I think it kind of... Um, it kind of bonds the reader and all of us together when you see other people speaking as well. No, you're right. It just ties it up into one neat package. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you deliver it to be opened, and it's really a gift. When um, You know, again, I'm going to say it, I don't know, for the upteenth time today, that I've learned more about people that I thought I knew from your book than, you know, reading volumes on them. You, you get to the point where... Um, there's something in every story that you tell that's new to me, and that's what kept me so entertained and wanting to get, you know, flip the page, you know, to the next story. And well, I wanted, there's also the challenge, I mean, imagine doing, imagine doing a chapter two on Bob Dylan where there's 700 books and thousands of articles. Yeah, I better yeah. bring something new to the table. Yeah. Well, I have. Right, you have. Um, and and so, I don't deserve a victory medal for this. No, you I'm do. Not gonna you, do the... you deserve kudos from somewhere. Well, yes, and there, it's coming. But uh -huh. I wouldn't do this stuff to do a, a hash or be any kind of hack writer. Um, you know, I, I really take this stuff very seriously, mm -hmm. and I know that people like you that have logged the fifty years as a fan or a collector and being in the industry and promoting right. you know to for you guys to invest and to sit here and uh and learn and recognize i'm beginning to understand a bit more about this guy who put this together right because you're reading about people that you kind of thought you kind of knew a whole lot about which you do right but you know what it's like to deliver 300 new pieces of information on people when most books you learn two things. Right. And, and what, what makes you an expert? Reading one more book than the next person. 
right? Yes, and by the way, um, again, I'm a, I don't read a whole lot of other no, people's... No, no, I'm talking about me, not you. you yes. You wrote it. Yes. You wrote it. Yes. I read your thing, and now I know you know a couple more uh, facts that I didn't know prior and, to... And, le- and let me tell you something. I'm extremely proud of... Of, I'm proud of all the books because I know, I know, I know how they were created, developed, or how they reached the marketplace under a lot of duress. Right. They got out there, but when it comes to people like Leonard Cohen and especially Neil Young, you know how documented those people are, Mm -hmm. especially this century, because of the internet and the official websites and all of that. And that's a real challenge to bring in new voices and new data into people that there have been books out on already. Mm-hmm. I delivered the message. Right. Next. Yeah. Um, it's a job. It's a passion. Um, but I do know one thing. It inspires a lot of people. And some of that karmic dividend seems to be, keep coming back to me. Because I'm getting a lot of encouragement, like, what are you doing next? Right. And stuff like that. Those words did not exist 20 and 30 years ago. Um, again, I pointed out most of the book publishing world was based in London or New York. Right. It, it, Hollywood wasn't the place for that. And I refused to relocate to New York. Plus, I completely parade my Los Angeles roots. Um, and I think... They're starting to really show right now because um, I'm watching the stampede of New York authors from Brooklyn and New York now move here mm-hmm. in search of them getting deals or trying to get into Hollywood. And, and most of them used to laugh at this place, and now I see them. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting that they're on my turf right now. It is. Um so, so, and I'm not in competition, no. but they they can't touch me in some of the areas that I chronicle. Believe me. Okay. Well, it sounds great. What I like to do now is we've been talking for over two hours, and I could go on for another two hours. But I think what I would like to do is, could, would you be willing to do a part two with me? Of course. Beautiful. You went to the concert for Bangladesh, but, but when I, you know, that to me, to me, that is like, you know, after Hebrew school, didn't they have something called the confirmation where you went for yeah. another year or something? Yeah, Was yeah. it called, con- remember, I did a year and I said, I'm out of here. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> is it called confirmation, right? I mean, yes, yes, we yes. go so far back, it's before they even had bat mitzvahs. You I know, know what I, I mean? I know, I know, I know. But, 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 but you have confirmation yeah. because you went to the concert for Bangladesh, so and you and I have a George and Ravi thing going on. Yeah, we it's and like, did, there's did, did, there's no problem. Let's do it again. Do you know how much the tickets were? I, were they six fifty? Thirteen dollars and fifty cents. Right. Wow. That was orchestra seats. How did you get your ticket? I Mail told order. You, I told you, my dad. Well, you knew that you knew the Madison Square Garden guy. Yeah, that's how I got the tickets. And where were your seats? Uh, they were um, like row eight, center. Wow. Yeah. You know, but but in those days, that was a curse. Because yes, because you had to stand up. And you had to stand close. up on those seats because everybody, they, they had like a 20-foot thing between the stage and, and the first row, and everybody ran into that area, and you couldn't see a damn thing. The same thing, well, it, the same thing for the 69 uh, Stones tour. Um, and again, we're talking those pivotal shows you saw, Bangladesh yeah. and 71, the Stones tour of 69. 69. They all come out on movies and DVDs yeah. that have chapters in my new book. Right. So somebody like you who physically attended, right. we have a term, you are a witness. Yes. You witnessed some of these things you never knew at the time. No. They were being lensed, let alone made into a movie or a soundtrack. Nope. And you never really thought a half a century later 
you'd be talking to some character like me, and we would be discussing the concert for Bangladesh, yeah. or me even knowing about you know Janis Joplin singing with uh, Ike and Tina, Ike and Tina right. at that at that show you saw where they opened for the Stones, and yeah. also I'm a guy that also mentioned BB King. People seem to forget about him, yeah. and you probably saw Terry Reed if I he saw was on uh, Terry Reed. In fact, Terry Reed's gonna right. Be, Terry Reed's coming on the show in a couple of weeks with Phil Jones. There you go. So you yeah. see, there yeah. aren't too many people. They're going to bring up B.B. King and Terry Reed to you. Yep. Um, yep. And I have to tell you, and um, I went to two of the November 69 Rolling Stone shows uh -huh. at the forum out here. Yeah. Um, I've written about it. Um, I was a teenager. I, I have to tell you, I don't want to be too graphic, but let's just say... B.B. King and then I and Tina Turner as the foreplay yeah. really set you up for the Rolling Stones really did. after. Really did. I mean, I mean, you were there. The yep. movie yep. shows it. But I'm telling you, B.B. King, yep. King was monumental that yep. night. Yep. And he was kind of, and remember why it struck me further um, in that November 8th show. I mean, I went there. 6.30 at night, and I came home at 5.15 the a.m. the next day. Yeah. The The first show started at 11.30, and the second show started close to 2 a.m. because oh. of a delay because of the ice from a hockey uh, yeah. game that okay. kind of watered the floor. Right, right, so right. you just think about, uh, you know, seeing that show then. But I can Tina Turner... They're from Ing they're living in View Park, Inglewood at the time, and BB King is sort of in the area. They're playing their hometown, opening for the Rolling Stones, who are recording and rehearsing in Los Angeles. Right. So there, there's there's this big melding of hometown talent with visitors from England who had always recorded in L.A. with the producer Andrew Luke Oldham, sure. sixty four to sixty seven, and those two shows just set me set me on some path that has resulted right now to this phone call we're having i know i'm i'm i am very proud of that because after that i wasn't going to fill out a law school application right yeah i know also let me ask you a question you saw the show and then you saw the 72 shows right With Steve yes Wonder. yeah um in my personal belief i was lucky to have seen the 69 show it was because the Stones were really the Stones, with nothing really added except the piano player. That's right. Right? It was it was the last time they went out without the horns. And it was interesting that the you were seeing a hardcore right. rock and roll band stripped down in sixty right. nine playing with big equipment, yep. you know, for the first time. Yep. Did you remember the uh, By seventy by seventy two it's an expanded augmented group, right. you know, with a horn and sax player and yes. extra keyboard player maybe and things like that. It was still remarkable, but it be it become a rock and roll act. Yes. And you know, Nikki, still fantastic. Nikki Hopkins, Exile on Main Street, love it. Fantastic. Nikki Hopkins, yep. brilliant piano player. Yep. But what you saw in '69 was some sort of. Uh, you saw the Rolling Stones. You saw the Rolling Stones go out there as a punk band, pretty much. They went right, out, and, you and, know, and and doing it in a big arenas with new sound system stuff. Yeah. But the thing you is, the Ampex guitars, the uh, see through. Well, they were, those were yep. the. It was a clear guitar. Yep. That you could see the 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 the, 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 the wiring inside Keith's guitar, yep. um, and and they also had an interesting kind of amp, uh, uh, amplifiers on that tour as well. Yeah, the MPEGs. Uh, right, and um, they were both really stellar um, events for me. Two shows in '69, five and '72, wow. um, and but but and and the '69 repertoire drew from earlier. Work where the uh, seventy two one was a showcase largely for Sticky Fingers and Exile on Main Street, yes. and I'm not I'm not complaining at all about no, the no, numbers. No, not at all. Not at all. But um, the world changed slightly after that. Um, well, yeah, Altamont it, it, Altamont kicked in at the end of that sixty nine talk. Yes, and and I have I have a, a a pretty different insight into the Altamont event in my my current book in my uh, Give Me Shelter chapter. Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, I went to college with Tony Fuchs, the, the, oh, my, the bodyguard sure. of, of, of the Stones and Mick Jagger, uh, who's on stage at Altamont, and he gives me some... Uh, well, he was a Vietnam veteran right. that I met at college. And uh, he later became Jim Morrison's uh, bodyguard for 11 months. Oh. But he, he had some interesting insights in the Altamont that I think are different than the perception well, it was, uh, that we constantly well, read about. I've been talking to Sam Cutler a lot. Right. And, uh-huh. uh, uh, Sam said it was um, uh, a pretty much a mafia problem at the time. You know, gang, it was, there was a gang, um, an underground gang thing going on. There was people involved in the Stones who kind of knew that nothing was going to be happening, you know, tour-wise, especially Altamont, money-wise. But they had the rights to the movie. Interesting. And, um, in fact, um, 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 Cutler told me a story where um, years later, you know, the Stones took off and left him in uh, San Francisco. Right. And he had a hideout at Garcia's place. That's when he became road manager for the dead, you know, because the Angels had to sit down with him. And um, they wanted the films. They wanted everything before um, anybody got to see them. So, anyway... um, a couple of years go by, and he gets a call from the um, um, mafia people, and one guy wants to meet him for dinner. So he goes out to dinner with this guy, and the guy says to him, uh, I'll be right back, I'm going to the restroom. And while he goes to the restroom, Sam pours liquid LSD in his water. Uh, and then the guy comes back, and Sam says, i got to go to the restroom, and he just leaves. He leaves the guy sitting there, and he doesn't know what happened after that. I don't, I don't, I've never met the, Sam Keller. I'm aware of his work with the Stones. Yeah. Um, no, I just think it was an event that just went haywire. There might have been other interests, but, um, you know, due to chaos, uh, uh, you've put on shows before. Never try to put on a concert with three days' notice. No, and you know what? Um, and and changing of venues, I think it would have gone down quite well at Golden Gate Park, and the original site. There's a there's a lot of things that coulda shoulda. Um, I think you know. I think we have a very important movie that emerged from it. It was a sad occasion on a lot of levels. But if you read my chapter on Gimme Shelter. Um, yes. There's a section by, there's some quotes from Harry Northup who went, and he had a delightful time at Altamont dancing oh, really? and eating food. And you see, it it wasn't all chaos and craziness. The oh. people, shall we say, in the back, yeah. um, they were not really aware of some of the tragedy and, 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 and craziness going on up front. So um, he provides a different um, view of Altamont. And so if you are interested in the legacy of the Rolling Stones, mm-hmm. I suggest you um, buy the book, but take a read of the chapter and give me shelter, because it's unlike... It is. Uh, it's unlike other chapters in, in books About and, them, yeah. and examinations on on this December 69 event, which yep. um, was, I think, 50... One years ago, Two yesterday, ago. or Two the day before. Yes, so, listening Sunday. to Harvey Keaton so on Not Your Mother's Radio. Please stay tuned for part two of Harvey and Elliot talking about music, books, and things in general. Stay safe.